So I am the emergency manager and safety officer at St. Luke's Hospital. That's my day job. Uh, this is turning into my, my second job. Uh, and if somebody would have asked me five years ago if I would be doing this, I would have said you're crazy. But so many things have changed in the last 15 years since I took over safety and emergency management at St. Luke's. I'm not going to say I never will again because you never really know what's going to happen. And it's sad that we're here today talking about this. I'd sooner I got uh, slide presentations on uh, backpacking trips to Montana and, and uh, diving in the Cayman Islands, which I would much rather be doing with you guys today. But uh, here we are. Active shooter, armed intruder. Uh, we have been doing at St. Luke's active shooter training for almost three years now. And we have gone through, last year was a big year for us, we went through most of our clinics last year. I think we got about nine or ten clinics uh, trained and did actual drills, live drills with them. And we've got a couple coming up uh, this year that we're trying to, we're trying to uh, get done. And the, the problem with the clinics we're working on now is they coexist with other businesses. And the interesting part about that is when we let the other businesses know that we're going to do this, they want to jump in and do it with us, which is great. It just requires the training part of it so that they have some idea on what they should do. And so today, what I'm going to uh, give you is a longer version of what I normally give to our staff. Those of you in healthcare know that time is precious. So what I've had to do is kind of dumb this down to one hour. And so some of what I, I'm talking about today I use, but the one hour presentation is usually a little bit more to the point. And I'm going to give you the same, uh, the same message I give them today is I'm going to hit you right between the eyes with this because I can't sugarcoat it. This is not something that you can sugarcoat. And so I apologize if a four, what, four letter word slips in here, but there are probably a few of them. So keep that in mind, but uh, again the energy level here is, is pretty high when I do this. How many of you recognize this? How many of you have been there, the Coliseum in Rome? It's, it's pretty awe-inspiring, isn't it? A lot of what we're dealing with today and what I'm going to be talking about is assessments and planning. Keep in mind, this is not a mass casualty exercise. This is not the power just went out. This is not a potable water drill where you're pretending that the water went out or went out for real. You can't stop in the middle of this or at the beginning of it and say, excuse me, don't shoot me, I need to read my plan. And it frustrates me to no end when we do drills, not this one, but MCI, they'll always hear, well, you need to make it easier to find the plan on the internet because when my staff heard the MCI call, they hurry up and went in online to try and read the plan. What are you going to tell the shooter? Excuse me, don't shoot me, I've got to find my plan, see what I'm supposed to do. The Romans started planning a long time ago. In this particular case, if you notice uh, along the bottom, all the different doors, they could load that to between 50 and 60,000 people in 15 minutes. And if they needed to evacuate, they could get it out in eight. They could unload 50,000 people out of that in eight minutes. Here and there. <clears throat> so if you, if you can get staff engaged and have them listen. You can plan this out ahead of time. Can we plan it down to the nth degree? Hardly. But at least we can give people options to think about. And so that's what I'm going to give you today, our options, some things that, that you can do. You need to get law enforcement involved in this. This is not something that you guys can do necessarily on your own. You can do the training and you can run the drills. But these are the guys that are going to come in in the middle of this and stop it. They also can tell you how they're going to respond. I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end, but I don't know how every jurisdiction responds. They're all different. I'm finding that out wherever I speak. It's different in some parts of northern Minnesota. And I'm finding out it's different down here. So you need these guys to come in at least with you when you're doing the training, and I always do. I'm going to do some training here in a couple weeks, and that's the, the law enforcement I want with me. Because they can tell the folks how they're going to respond. They were with us when we did the hospital last year, and it's very interesting. That's a, that's a different, different situation out there. In most cases, if something happened here today, law enforcement would be here in a matter of five minutes or less. 
Unfortunately, the sheriff told the staff up there that even if I'm in my car, sitting in my office, whatever, on the kibitz to get the piece, that you're 45 minutes on your own. That is eternity in one of these situations. So they need to work their plan accordingly. What are they going to do? They're going to have to hold out for 45 minutes. <clears throat> When I come in and do the training, the first thing that I do is an assessment. And I'm not going to talk specifically about an assessment today, but as I'm going through, I'm going to tell you things to look at. <clears throat> when we talk about running, I'm going to tell you some things to, to look for. When we talk about barricading and hiding, I'm going to tell you some things to look for. And then when we talk about fighting, I'm going to tell you some things to look for. But it's all about options. You can't read the plan when somebody starts shooting. You can't say, wait a minute, i got to find it. Those of you that are Joint Commission accredited, you also know that when the Joint Commission comes in, if you're the emergency person in a the hospital, they're specifically asking you, what's going on? What do you do in an MCI? What do you do in a potable water? What do you do in an evacuation? They might when they do their emergency management uh, visit with you. But when they're out on the unit, they're asking you or you or you, what do you do? And so staff needs to really understand what their options are in these circumstances. So again, what we do is we give a few weeks in between so that people can decide what their plan is. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to rearrange offices or what you can do in, in patients' rooms and so on and so forth today. So we, when, we, when I come in, we talk about those things, and then I tell the staff, go back and figure out what your plan's going to be. Because when we come in, we come in with an AR-15 with blanks in it. And we do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, it gets the hair on the back of their neck standing up. And number two, it gives them a chance to hear what the shots sound like inside and how far they travel in that facility. If you have been outside and heard shots, they, sound, they have a lot of high frequency to them. If you were to shoot in here today, it would sound like somebody dropped a big Bible on it. Reason being is the seating tile, the carpeting, our clothes, the backs of the chairs, the sheetrock and stuff on the wall absorbs the high frequencies. So you're left with the deep tones. So it sounds really deep. It also, I would guess, if we shut the doors here, you probably wouldn't hear it out by the information desk. And that's critical because there's some things in those particular cases that the staff that's running needs to do. Again, involve law enforcement. You use blanks. You can tabletop the aftermath. You can tabletop getting your plan together. But as far as the run, hide, fight part of this, which is what we're talking about today, and I don't care what you do, you basically have those three options, run, hide, fight. And that's hard to, that's hard to do in a tabletop because your plan's going to work in a tabletop. I'm going into that med room. I'm going to be able to get my key out and open the door and I'm going in there and slam it shut and shut the lights off and silence my cell phone. It's all going to work. I'm here to tell you it's not going to work. And so that drill is really what cements it. And yes, people are apprehensive. The morning of the drill when we come in, everybody is pretty somber and they're nervous, and that's a good thing. I uh, always tell people before that, uh, when I'm done with the training, uh, we're going up to tomorrow to do an active shooter drill up there, and I told the staff when I was done, I said, go home and go to the, buy yourself your favorite piece of pie or your favorite beverage and put it on the counter in the morning that we do the drill and look at it and say, I'm going to come home and eat you or drink you tonight. Because you will. If you don't make it home, it isn't because our drill. It will be for some other reason. Usually after the, sec after the first one, people start having a little bit more fun with it and realize that they are going to live, I'm not really shooting anybody, and they start <coughs> thinking about what they're supposed to do. And that's important. That's very important. So we come in in the mornings. And we either I'm the shooter, the law enforcement is a shooter, depending upon the type of firearm they want to use. We have staff go back to where they normally sit, and then we start in the lobby. The second drill, we will start in an exam room, or we will come in a different exit, entrance, whatever, and kind of try and surprise staff, because you never know where this is going to happen. Every, everybody knows that today is the day of the drill. There's, there's a funny story about that, though, no, and you guys know this, no matter how much you let people know, emails, phone messages, in your newspaper. We had one scenario, one drill in one of our clinics where the lady forgot it was the drill, and she came in to work late, 
and she walked in right in the middle of this. And she goes, oh my God, I walked in and she goes, I'm thinking we really got a shooter here. And so she went and she did exactly what she was supposed to do. And then she said, I saw you walk by and then I realized, ah, today was the drill. And I didn't find her, which is good. So but yeah, this is all fully announced. What we do is the first time we'll start in the lobby, second time we won't tell them where we're coming from. We also want people to be in a different area, and I'll, I'll go into why here in a minute. So please involve your law enforcement and anybody else that you can. We usually try and get sheriffs, we usually try and get the uh, local PD. Down here you've got a lot of PD. Up on the range and uh, in north, the northeastern part of Minnesota, they don't have local police departments, they rely on the sheriff's department, so it's really important you get them in. The other thing is, that may be the only time these law enforcement agents get into the building. Most of the time they're not stopping, they're just walking through. So this gives them a chance to see what that building looks like, get a relationship going with the, man, the emergency manager there or whoever it is, and start talking about some things. And we've had some cases where after 15 or 20 minutes realizing how are they going to get in, that they start issuing them badges or keys or whatever so that law enforcement can get in. Law enforcement might make some suggestions. In one clinic they said, you know, if you could, you've got five different corridors here that lead off the lobby. If you could number them, and if somebody, when they call 911, could give us a heads up, they're down four, or they're down three, or they're down one, that might help us. Now, if they get there 10 minutes later after you make the first call, probably isn't. But if they can get there two or three minutes later, and those, those areas are big, depending upon the corridors, that might help them get to where they need to get faster. I'm not going to make a political statement today. That's not why I'm here. But can anybody tell me, really, is this going to work? No. It will not. I do permit carry classes, just defensive. Just, I've been doing training for 35 years. I will obey this sign because in Minnesota, if I see this sign, I have, I have two warnings. This is the first one if I'm carrying. I can carry past this and sometimes you don't see them. They need to be certain size and I know in a lot of buildings they're not by the door, they're on the window next to it and you miss them. But if I walk into this facility and somebody sees that I'm carrying and says, please remove it, we have a sign, I need to do that. And I will because I'm a law-abiding citizen. But I would bring my gun out because I know if I don't, they call the police, we start doing this thing about, okay, you know, the first time is a $25 fine and it starts going up from there. So keep that in mind. So what's this all about? It's all about awareness. If it looks like a duck, flies like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck. It's not a pheasant with webbed feet. What I tell our staff, because I always hear about five minutes into the presentation, a hand will come up from somebody and they'll go, I don't even know why I'm here. And I'll say, why? I'm at the front desk. I'm going to be the first person shot. I'm pretty much dead, so I'm just going to leave and go back and I'm going to contemplate what this is going to feel like. And I go, no, you don't need to do that. Be aware of what's going on around you. Exits. How many of you, right now, without looking around you, look where the other exits are in this room when you came in today? That's a few of you. I did a presentation like this in uh, last November, and I got there a little bit late because the roads were, were kind of messy, and I wasn't the first person to speak, so it worked out really well. And I walked into the keynote presentation, and the room was full, about 250 people. There was one exit behind the person speaking, and there were four down this side. So when it came time for me to speak an hour later, I had 40 or 45 people in the room, and I said, how many of you noticed all the different exits in and out of that room? And one person raised their hand. So I got 40 or 45 people, only one, other, one person besides me knew that there were five exits besides the one they came in out of that room. That's not very, very good. There's no awareness there. 9-11, more people died because they didn't know how to get out of the building than for any other reason. Fire drills were not mandatory. It was not mandatory for you to participate. So people would come in the, the front door, take the elevator up to the same floor that they did every day, 
get off in the lobby, walk down the same hallway to their desk. The fire alarms would go off, they would page, this is a fire drill, nobody would do anything. At 5 o'clock they would get up, they'd retrace their steps out the front door. Now all of a sudden an airliner hits your building. Elevators don't work, full of smoke, water going off, people screaming. They had no idea where to go to even find the exits. I teach up at, at the University of Minnesota in the safety program up in Duluth. <clears throat> One of the things I have my students do is to go out and look at fires starting from 1900 all the way up to today. Do you know what the biggest cause of death is in the fires? Everybody trying to get out the same door. And it hasn't changed. The station nightclub fire out in uh, uh, New Hampshire back in, in the early 2000s when Great White was playing and the, they had the pyrotechnics, everybody tried to get out the front door. They were literally trying to pull people out. People got trampled. There were four other exits out of that building. Nobody took them. Half a dozen people took them because if one person did, and he's the person, if you go online, there's a video there, and he's watching people trying to get out the front door, and they couldn't make it. Everybody's jammed in there. That's what awareness is all about. So I tell the people at the front desk, look, if you're in a clinic and it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon and you've got a gentleman out there and they've got a black tassel cap on and a long trench coat and it's 80 degrees outside and they're pacing back and forth and they're looking in your window and you look at your list of patients and you've got Sven and Oli and Toivo and Lena and Betty and that's not one of them, now your awareness is there and your alert level's up a little bit. And maybe, maybe at this point, you need to call 911. And I haven't found a law enforcement agency yet that said, no, don't call us because nothing's happened right now. There's a couple things that go on here. Number one, you are controlling the energy level at this point in time. As long as you control the energy level, you can think a little bit. You can think fairly clearly. Maybe this person is from a construction site across the street and their boots are full of mud but they need to use a restroom and they're just looking to see where the nearest restroom is in the lobby so they don't get your floor all dirty. And if that's the case, when the police get there, everything's fine. But if you say, I'm going to wait, and all of a sudden from under that coat they pull out a gun or a knife or a machete and they come in the door, now who's controlling the energy level? They are. And that's when things start to happen. So awareness, call it what it is. We did a drill one time, and there's an actual case where this happened down in, in, I believe it was in North Carolina. We did the drill in the lobby the first time, and then we moved up a floor. And we didn't tell them where we were coming from. And I was the disgruntled employee. I wasn't the shooter that day, but I had the badge. And we walked into our <coughs> infectious disease clinic from the back stairwell. There is a lady sitting here, Sergeant the Blue PD was a shooter, he's got, the, he's got my M16 over his shoulder, and he's standing there, and he goes, hi! And this lady's looking at him, and about where that gentleman is there in the church, there's another lady looking at him, and about where the door is, maybe a little further, there's three doctors and two more staff, and they're looking at him. And he's standing there, he goes, hi! Nobody did a thing. And he popped off two shots, and then everybody did something. So when we were done and we did our debrief, he said, why didn't you guys run? They said, well, you didn't do anything. You walked in and you said, really nice, hi. <laughs> he said, is it normal that somebody comes up the back stairwell with an AR-15 on a daily basis and says, hi? You're in denial. And that happened in a hospital. Guy walked in with a shotgun, past the front desk, up the elevator to the fourth floor, got off, walked past the nurse's station, went down to a doctor's office and shot the doctor and a nurse. And when they asked the staff afterwards, why didn't somebody say something until he started shooting? He said, he wasn't doing anything. Is that normal? This gentleman was worried when I walked in with a backpack this morning. And yet here we are, a guy with a gun, and nobody does anything. That's awareness. People, you guys need to start being aware more. You need to let your staff know it's okay to call 911 while you control the energy level. Because when somebody else takes over that energy level, things don't work real well. The other thing I do before I do the drill is a building assessment. What locks and what doesn't? And how it locks? Can you create a safe room? I'm not a fan of creating safe rooms. Some organizations are. The reason I don't like that is because your mindset then is I got to get to the safe room even though there may be an exit right here. So 
So it's okay to do that, but you also have to have staff remember that if they can get out, get out. Reception desks, escape routes. One of the things we're doing when we plan our clinics right now is we make sure there's a door behind them so that if the reception desk realizes something's happened, they can get out really quick. And the door's got a lock on it, and I'll talk more about that in a little while. Windows and offices and rooms. Yeah, obviously, this room on the first floor here is not a really good situation. If somebody started shooting on the outside today or in the lobby, whatever, we, with the, all the glass in here, we got a problem. The best place is right in through here. But again, look at those kind of things. So you can remind staff, look, if you're here, you need to do something else. You can't stay there. What can you move? I know some of you are not in hosp uh, from hospitals today. The same thing applies, though, when you look at some of my pictures where somebody's got an exam table up against the door. It can be a desk. It can be a file cabinet. But those things need to be moved today. A lot of people have their offices set up so that when you walk in, there's two chairs right here, and the file cabinets are nicely arranged in the corner, and everything looks really nice, and that's good. But if all of a sudden somebody's shooting in a hallway and you can't get out and there's no lock on your door, you can't call housekeeping and come up with a two-wheel dolly to move your file cabinet up against your door. And so you may want to rearrange some of those things today. Also realize, can I move my desk? Not, not time to find out when somebody starts shooting. <clears throat> we talked about entrances before, but also monitors. There's some facilities that I've been into where there's doors a half a block away that open. In those particular cases, maybe you want to put some monitors on, the, on, on those doors with a switch that when that door opens that that monitor switches to that that camera switches so the person at the front desk can see who's coming and going out of those doors those kinds of things to think about maybe a sound monitor in hospitals and clinics we have to change the culture about being so wide open we have to change people's minds to be able to lock things <clears throat> Some, several of our clinics are laid out where you walk into a lobby like this and it, it, it splits out on either side of you and there's three or four or five entrance doors back to different <coughs> practices, excuse me, family practice or radiology or the lab or whatever. I finally got those clinics to lock those doors. They didn't want to at first. Well, you know, maybe they, somebody needs to use a bathroom. There's, a, there's, there's two bathrooms right here in the lobby. Well, they come in in the morning and they go right back to the lab because once a week they get their blood drawn. Well, the person in the lab's kind of expecting them, right? Yeah. And there's somebody at the front desk, right? Yeah. You lock the door and the front desk calls to the lab and says, hey, Betsy, your Mrs. Smith is here. There's no reason for anybody to get past that door until it's time for their appointment. Lock the door. If you can keep them out, that saves a lot of hassle. It saves a lot of lives. Keep them in a lobby. They can't get out. They're stuck in the lobby. They either got to go, they, they can't go anywhere. They got to go back out, outside. But if those doors are open, people can get in. Same thing in a hospital. Our birthing center is locked down, and it took some incidents before that happened. Our ICU is locked down. Our surgery is locked down. Good things. We can't be as open as we used to be. We just can't. When you are looking at building new clinics, new facilities, Build them to be more secure, especially the clinics at the front desks. You, know, you walk right up and there's, there's nothing here except the countertop, and right behind them is a door. We have several clinics that are that way, and if you jump the desk, you've got access to the whole building. You got over 20 feet to the right, there's a door with a badge reader on it. What good's that? So think about that. If you're the safety person or the emergency manager at your facility or the facilities director, think about those kinds of things. How can I limit access? Do it now. It's cheaper when you're building the first time than it is to go back and remodel and add things a second time. Run, hide, fight. I wish I had more options for you. There aren't any. Homeland Security has some uh, guidelines out there. Use them. Tailor them to what will work in your facility. Because I don't care what you, what you do, these are basically your only options. So we're going to spend some time going through each one of these. But first of all, there are some things that will happen to you when you don't control that energy level anymore and you are trying to save your life or worried about trying to save somebody else's life. You will lose fine motor skills. 
If you think that you have a key ring with five keys on it, and you're going to find the right key to lock your door when somebody's screaming down the hall and shooting people and your coworkers are screaming running by, it's not going to happen. And I'm not telling you this because I think it's not going to happen. I'm telling you this because when we do our drills, I've seen this stuff not work. That's why we let people think about it for a while. What's my plan? I'm going to lock my door. I'm going to do this. And then we let them try it. My motor skills are gone. Well, auditory exclusion, you may not hear anything. You may not even hear the shots. You may not even hear people screaming. If you see what's what's starting to transpire, you may not hear anything. Time dilation, it's going to seem like forever. Time will slow down. It's going to seem like 10 minutes and it was 10 seconds. And tunnel vision, you may just be able to focus on one thing, not aware of what's going on around you at all. I've seen all these things happen to people. Sometimes one thing, sometimes all of them. Again, when we do this, we, all, we bring in law enforcement. And law enforcement is always asking, when I call, what is the safety guy doing and the emergency manager running these kinds of drills? So I have to get into my background. I'm 3ECHO certified. And for those of you that don't know what 3ECHO is, we'll talk about it later. And I've done some training with the military and the law enforcement. And I mentioned what we, what we do in the training, and I invite them to come in, and I mention these things. And one police chief up in northern Minnesota said, you are absolutely correct. And he said, I'll tell you a story that drives this home. He said, I was in Mango, and I was the deputy commander of the SWAT team down there. And he said, we actually had an active shooter. We had one while I was down there. He said, I had eight years of military experience, and I had 17 years of law enforcement. So I've got... 25 years of experience and he said we got called to a residence and there was a gentleman inside that had actually been firing out of the house and he said we so we get there he said we're, we're all suited up and it was myself and the three guys that were on my team and I was told go to the back door we want to keep this guy in the building we don't want him loose in the neighborhood with with a gun so he said I get halfway around the house and I heard some noise and I had no idea what that noise was until my earpiece cracked, shots fired, shots fired. I was, whoa, that's what that sounds like. He said, I've either been, I've always been around the shots when they've happened. I've never been outside when they've happened inside or vice versa. He said, that was, that was interesting because it doesn't sound like what you think. And that's what people will tell you when we do the drills. It sounds like somebody dropped the big book. It sounds like somebody pushed the file cabinet over. It sounded like there was a guy with an air nailer and we thought it was construction. And so I said, we got around the back of the building, and I keyed the mic in position. And I'm told immediately, breach, we want to keep him in the house, and he's trying to get out the back. So he said, my three guys waited at the bottom of the stairs. He said, this is a residential house, so the stairs aren't wide. And they waited to see if I could get the door open. So he said, I ran up the stairs, and I put my boot up against the door, and the door popped open. He said, I stepped in, and over a half door came an 85-year-old man with two handguns. He said, I wish I'm, he said, I hope I'm that limber when I'm 85. He said, the guy landed and started firing at me with two guns. He said, I know he was firing at me because the last thing I remember, the last thing I remember was my three guys were still at the bottom of the stairs. He said, Mike, all it was that I could do with all the experience and the training I had was to bring the gun up, put it on target, and pull the trigger. He said, if I had not had all that experience and that training, he said, I would be dead right now. He said, I'm shooting at the guy, and he said, I know I'm hitting him. I'm positive I'm hitting him. And he said, I'm thinking, why isn't this guy dropping? Am I going to have to switch the full auto and cut him in half? He said, finally the guy dropped. He said, Mike, I thought it was a 10-minute gun battle. He said, it was over in less than 10 seconds. There were 42 shots fired. He said, my three guys had entered and were returning fire. I didn't know that. had no clue they were even there. 42 shots fired. He said, I heard zero never heard the first shot, never heard the last shot, 42 shots. He said, all I heard was my M16 action going click, click, click. No idea the other three guys are in the room with me. 25 years of experience training, and we expect our staff to react when it happens for the first time without some training, without some experience in this. That's why we do the drills. It's 
so people really understand. I'll go back to my clinics a year later and they're still thinking about this. They're still asking questions. They're still telling me what their plan is and that they rehearse it. When we do the training, we're trying to build muscle memory. Just like the police officer, the muscle memory was bring the gun up, put it on target, pull the trigger. If he hadn't practiced that, he may not have been alive. The police train different. Law enforcement, military trains differently now than they did in the past. There's a book called On Combat. It's written by a gentleman named Lieutenant Colonel Grossman. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. I know he's been speaking all over the country. Probably the, the, the foremost presenter on what happens to you in these circumstances. And in his book, he talks about some scenarios where law enforcement, how they used to train and why they don't do that anymore. And there's one scenario where the uh, police officer is in Los Angeles and he wants to get really, really good at disarming somebody that jumps out with a gun. Because where he works, a lot of convenience stores and there have been a lot of robberies. So he buys his wife and his three kids toy guns. And he says, when I'm walking around the house at night, I want you to jump out with the gun and I want to practice disarming you. So I get really good at it. And he did. He got really, really good at it. And one day, he got called to a convenience store. And he's walking down the aisle and a guy jumps out with the gun and he disarms the guy. It was brilliant. But if this young lady is my wife and I disarm her, what do I need to do with that gun if I want her to do it again? I need to give her the gun back, right? He gave the guy the gun back. His partner shot him before, shot the guy before he could turn the gun back around. Military, they used to train you know, a couple of shots and then they pull the gun down and assess. And we still teach that in, in, when we do permit carry classes, not quite to that extent. But what, what you do when you do that and look around is you clear the tunnel vision. So what you would see in the videos of police in the middle of a gun battle is they're going bang, bang, and then they look around and then they fire two more shots. They don't do that anymore. They stay on target until they neutralize it. How many of you know what a revolver is? Okay, it's the cylinder, the old John Wayne, all right? In Los Angeles, in one of the precincts, the drill instructor, the shooting instructor, didn't want the guys to inject the brass on the floor, so he had them put it in their hand, put it in their pocket until they were all done, and they'd empty their pockets out. After they get done with a, with a real shooting, they would come in for interrogation, and their pockets are full of brass. So we don't want our staff to be stuck in those modes. We want them to do what they can do and practice what works, and we want them to win. And so when we do these drills, we tell everybody, if you go, you're going to win today. You are going to win. Those of you that have been in the military, did they teach you to lose? Any former law enforcement, they don't teach you to lose, right? They teach you to win. And so that's what this is all about, training our staff so that they do what will work. So when we do the drills, if they screw up the first time, they live to do it again and again. And we tell them, next time, let's try something different and make sure that you win. It's up here. So these are the things that will happen to you. So have a plan. Have your staff think about it. Visualize it. Visualization is powerful. We obviously can't train every day, whether it's an MCI or whether it's an active <coughs> shooter kind of scenario, but visualization is powerful. If you sit down and you're at the reception desk and you think, if I see somebody come in and they pull a gun or a knife or a machete, and by the way, I see that, my plan is I'm going to immediately get up, run through the door behind me and slam the door shut because I pre-locked it. Gross motor skills, get up, run, slam the door shut. Nothing fancier than that. If you sit down and think about it, and I'll tell you a little story about visualization here in a little while, it will work. And then have them do it. Don't just not do it the day of the drill. I tell them, come in every morning. Yes, you are. You're vulnerable. I'm not going to tell you you aren't. If you don't think about this till it happens, I, I don't know what's going to happen to you. But if you think about it, if you visualize it, and I know we've all done that. You probably all have. All of a sudden, you win an award, and you've been thinking about, I want to win that award. And it's like, whoa, I thought about this. And I'm walking up, and I'm getting the award. It happened to me a couple of times, not because I won an award. <clears throat> but if you think about it every day, everywhere. When you walk out of here today, I know you want to take this back to your organizations. But there's a reason why police officers always sit with their back to the wall facing the door. 
And they don't just do it when they're in their office. They do it when they're out eating donuts and pizza with their wives and whatever. I have a, the, the gentleman that does uh, permit to carry classes with us is a, is a conservation officer. And he said, my wife already knows. We'll walk in and she'll go, oh, no, I know you're sitting there. Yep. He said, after 30 years of marriage, she finally figured it out. Same thing with the kids. Mom, don't sit there. Dad's sitting there. They do that for a reason. Be aware of what is happening around you, as we talked about before. What looks out of place? And if you have to elevate that energy level, you do it. Don't wait for somebody else to do it for you. So let's talk about run. First and foremost, this is what you should do. When you talk to the police about the different things that you have, they say, get out. If there's an exit there, get out if you can. And I can't tell you whether that's your best choice at that time. You need to determine that. I did this for a mental health clinic. And those people were like, well, what if? I mean, we did what ifs all morning. Well, what if I hear that out in the hallway, do I stay in my office or do I run? I don't know. Does it sound like it's down the end of the corridor? Does it sound like it's right outside your door? If it's right outside your door, probably running isn't a good thing because when you run out the door and if this gentleman is a shooter and I run out the door and he's right there, yeah, what am I going to do? Turn around? Give him my back? No. At that point, my only option is to fight. At least for me. I'm not going to give anybody my back. If I'm going down, I'm going down fighting. Police will tell you they want you to get out because there's less targets. And it also makes it easier for them when they come in the building. If the police came in here right now because of a shooter, I don't know how many of the people, there's probably 50 people in here, we're all suspect. They have to visually eyes on everybody to make sure that there isn't a gun coming out from someplace. <clears throat> Remember, their energy level is high. They're coming into a shooting situation. We're running away from it, folks. They're running to it. And I don't care what you say about the police and how bad things can be sometimes and what you see on the TV, but I do a lot of work with them, and most of them are there, all of them that I know, are there to help us. They're running to the bullets. We're running away from them. And so everybody in here, they're going to have to do a look, and they're going to, they're going to slow down because they don't want somebody to come up from behind them. If you're not here, they can just breeze through this room and go where they need to go. So they're going to tell you to run. There's some things that you need to be aware of when you're running. Number one, do it quick. Make sure you know where you're going to go. You need to be aware of long hallways. When you're training with your staff, make sure if there's another way to get out of here, for example, if you can go down, oh, this door here, and that gets you to a lobby where you can get out, take it. Long hallways, somebody's standing right here and everybody's filing out down there trying to get out that one exit. If you're the shooter, it's like, the circuit, like the carnival, everybody's filed into one spot. You don't really have to do much except point the gun down there and pull the trigger. This actually happened in one of our clinics. There was the police where the shooter, they breached the, the front door, and everybody is running out down that hallway to get out that door back there. And so when we did the debrief, we said, why? Why do you think everybody was running out that door? Habit. Habit. Exactly. Well, that's the door I come in every morning. Duh. <laughs> The next time we did it, they didn't. There were clearly uh, two other ways out of that building, and, and everybody other than the x-ray department, which is right down on the end of that hallway, that's really their only way out unless they run back towards the shooter, went out that door. The other thing that is really, really hard to do is to get people to call 911. You would think, you would think that that would be the easy. It's not. So again, stop to remember, always be aware of what's going on around you, be aware of long hallways. Know where the exits are. And when I say that, I mean not just there's an exit right there. Have your staff go to the exits they are not familiar with and open the door and see where it goes. And the reason I say that is I was up at a hospital the other day and they said, I said, Pete's beautiful courtyard. They said, yeah, but don't go out there because there's nowhere to go. So if your staff runs out into that courtyard and there's nowhere to go, they're stuck. Maybe not what you want them to do. So be aware of where those exits lead you. Practice. And not just from where you go every day. Let others know why you are running. That sounds like it should be pretty simple too, right? We've had entire clinics get up and leave and nobody tell the other people that don't know why they're leaving why they're leaving. 
We had one clinic where the, the ladies played it to the to the hilt, and Sergeant Luke PD walks back after we've been shooting for a while, and there's two ladies sitting at the internal nursing station, and he says, why are you still here? He said, well, we had some people ran down the far corridor. There was two of them there, but we didn't know whether they had diarrhea or not. They didn't say anything. I thought maybe they were running to the bathroom really quick. You have to remind staff that they may be the ones that heard the shot, but the people farther back aren't going to. And that again becomes evident when we do the drills. And so they need to say something, shooter, guy with a gun, lady with a knife, whatever, so that people know why they're running and that they can alert them. They have to do that. And, I, and I'm, it, that just didn't happen once, that's happened a lot. Because people panic. It takes three seconds to panic. And in most cases, even though people know this is a drill, these things start kicking in. And they won't say anything. They just run. They just run. Plain language. I still do presentations for people that use code silver. Like, what's that? Code white. Well, up in northern Minnesota, in a lot of cases, that's a severe weather, winter, storm. People pull out their badges and they have to start looking on the back of their badges. What is this? You're not fooling anybody. In fact, in Wisconsin, the state passed a law several years ago and told them what they had to call all these things. The Minnesota, Health, uh, uh, Minnesota Department of Health and the uh, Minnesota Hospital Association lobbied our legislature to not do that to allow us to make our own choices, but it's plain language. So at St. Luke's and all our clinics, whatever, it's, it's an armed intruder. And where? Armed intruder in where? There's no guessing. You want people to know. You don't want people to start having to figure it out. And we had code nine, code lights, code blues, code reds, code plan seven. It's like people just can't remember it. Plain language. You want people to know. You don't want to have them have to look to see what it is. This doesn't happen every day. We are starting to put in our clinics a single tone system. And we can even make it uh, better if we want to, we can, we can kind of bastardize a couple of systems so that if you hit a button in the lobby, it will go over the lobby armed intruder, over the PA system armed intruder in the lobby. You can do that. And that's the nice part about that is as you're running out the door, you're running down the back hallway, if you get that button and it locks on, that's the only time that tone comes on. So think about that. A tone that when you hit that, that means there's somebody in here causing harm. Remember the definition of what an active shooter is. It boils down to four words. Someone actively engaged in killing. So you want people to know right away to get out of it. That's what this is all about. Actively engaged in killing. Let people know what's going on, where it's going on, so that they can do something about it. We've had plans where, and ours does too, if you're in a room and you can't get out, and you call 911, page overhead, let somebody know that, so that everybody knows where this event is happening. We've done 25 or 26 of these drills. How many of you believe that that's ever happened? Not once. It happened because the emergency manager stayed by the lady, the lady in the PBX and told her, all right, we got an event going on in, in the emergency room, page it overhead. It was a drill. Nobody even called her. Brad standing there, it came out three times wrong. Every time she said it, it came out different. All we knew was that there was something going on in the emergency room. So that's where that tone comes in. Nobody has ever paged overhead or called the operator in the hospital to tell them what's going on. Things change up here when this is all happening. People will barricade, they're afraid to take their hands off the door because they don't think that the desk they have up there and the file cabinet up there is gonna stop anybody. They literally want their hands on the door knowing that they're putting pressure on it. They can't relieve themselves of that duty to hold their hands up there to get to a phone. Create a safe room if you can. All right. Make sure you call 911. Make sure you call 911. This seems normal, right? Had entire clinics, nobody's called 911. Sergeant Sheen in the case was a shooter again, going, cool, I'm still shooting people. 
And now I'm going to go back to some of those rooms that I know were have people in them because I couldn't get in before, and I'm going to spend some time trying to get in here because the cavalry's not coming. It happens. Our clinic in 45 people. First scenario, how many people pretended to call 911? Four people raised their hand. Not good. If those had been the first four people killed, we wouldn't have had anybody calling 911. And so we talked about it. The sheriff's deputies talked about it. You've got to call us. We're the guys that are coming in. We're the good guys with the guns. We're going to stop this. So we did the drill again. Guess how many people called 911 the second time? Six people out of 40, 45. We got a little better. Same, same thing. People were afraid. The ones that were barricaded were afraid. The other ones that were running were still running in their mind. They were still running. They never thought about it. So we spend some time on this and we do the training. How many of you have your cell phones with you today? How many of you, when you hit the button to awaken it and you swipe it, have ever seen that emergency word in the lower left-hand corner? How many of you have ever pushed it? And if you tell me you have and it's gone to 911, I'm going to tell you you're lying because it doesn't. I've yet to find one that does. So you push it. Where does it go? If you pushed it, where does it go? If you have it, push it. Most of the time, it goes to your keypad. We have had them go to the last number they dialed. They're calling grandma, going, hey, grandma, we got a shooter here. Doesn't work. Because if that's the case, then you've got to get back to the keypad. Try that when somebody's banging on your door out there, going, hey, you fired me yesterday for no reason. I'm going to kill you. Some of them, unfortunately, have gone to people's contact list. So now you've got to swipe out of that and get to the keypad and punch in 911 and hit send. Right now I have to hit 911 and send. That's all I have to do. You'd be surprised how many people can't even do that when it's right there. I have had people tell me that they have sat there and watched their house burn down with the keypad up like this and could not punch the buttons because of the reaction to the stress that they're having. One lady told me my neighbor came over and said, did you call 911? She goes, no, I can't push the button. So her neighbor grabbed the phone and did it. Which is the other point. If you noticed, you could get to this without having to punch your pin in, for those of you that have pins. Why is that? But if I'm running down the hall and I don't have my cell phone and this gentleman's phone is on the floor and I pick it up, I don't even know his pin because I can get to my keypad for an emergency call without knowing his pin. That's why that is there. I can grab anybody's phone in here, swipe it, hit emergency, and I will get a keypad so that I can call 911 from somebody else's phone. Most people don't know this. If you've not done this, are you the same people that don't know whether you have a spare tire in your car? Or whether you have a jack? Or where it is? Or do you just have a can of foam? Same thing about all those people not knowing where the exits were. 200 people in a room, everybody was going out the back exit except for one person. Remind staff, so we do this. And most of the time when I'm doing it, there's half a dozen staff that have their phones, so everybody has a chance to hear this. So this is one of the things that we, we make sure that we drill in when we do the training, because most people have no clue about that. Now, I've got an iPhone. It's easy on my iPhone. My wife's got an Android, and it takes a little work to find that button. So make sure that you, you look when you get home or out of here tonight, whatever phone you have. Where is that emergency word, and where does it go when I hit the button? I've had somebody tell me, well, it automatically calls 911. It doesn't. I've had somebody tell me, well, it came up with those numbers highlighted. I've never seen that happen yet. But what I have seen are those three things. It comes up to your keypad, your last number dialed, or your contact list. So again, things to keep in mind. Make sure you call 911. Have coworker cell phone numbers so that when you leave and you're running down the street and you stop someplace, you can let people know where you are. And that's important And in the end. So in clinics, we always tell people, make sure you share people's phone numbers, have it in your contact, your manager, whatever. We do, and tell our staff, to call our doctor's call-in number wherever they wind up. So if they're in uh, Silver Bay and they wind up at the local gas station because of a shooting, they call 249-2400 and that gets them right to the operator who it screams because it's a doctor's call-in number, they have to answer it immediately, and they patch them down to security. That does two things, because in all the drills we've done, nobody's bothered to call St. Luke's and let them know 
that there's a shooting at, at that particular clinic. So that does two things. That takes care of one of those things. So the operator now will patch that person down to security who will keep a list of where all these people are and the operator will call 911 and say, hey, we just got a call from our clinic up in Two Harbors, there's an active shooter situation. So I don't know, again, who, how, you know, what you folks have, but think about those kinds of things because this isn't, okay, well, it, it's, it's 1108 and, and uh, you know, okay, it's 1130, it's probably done now, I'm going to walk back to the clinic or the hospital and to get there you're walking right back into the shooting. And the second thing is you may not go back, PD may want to corral you someplace so that they can interrogate you. Because we all know that if we go home tonight and we have a bottle of our favorite beverage and we start talking to everybody we know about what happened tomorrow morning, that's gonna get twisted. So have some way for your staff to call into a central location so that when this is over, you can tell them what's going on. The other thing to tell staff when they're when they're calling 911 or whatever is how many if they can, how, what did they see? One person, two persons, handgun, long gun, one gun, two guns. The more information that they can call when they give to 911, the more information the police have when they come in and they can control their energy level as to what's going on. If it's a handgun, it's gonna be different than if it's a long gun. The other thing about um, Cell phones is how long does it take if it's off? It's going to seem like eternity. Mine takes about a minute and a half to come on. Somebody's banging on my door, that's a long time. Um, silence them when you're hiding. Why do we want people to silence their cell phones when they're hiding? If you're a staff nurse on a floor or whatever, or the HR manager, is your phone going off in the middle of meetings? If something happens in your facility and all of a sudden there's 15 police cars and a sheriff's car and a SWAT team outside, do you think it's going to be on social media really quick? And everybody you know is going to call you because folks there's people that want you to come home tonight and that's something else you have to keep in mind there's somebody that wants you to come home tonight and they're going to be worried about you and so they're going to light up your phone are you okay are you okay we see all the police cars out there what's going on so that's why we want you to silence them the other thing to keep in mind because as we do these drills we learn more things when you have this thing even if it's if it's off right now what happens when somebody calls you on your phone? What happens to the screen? If it's a text or if it's a phone call, it lights up, right? So we're doing a drill, we open the door and it's pitch black in there because we tell people to shut the lights off and all of a sudden I'm looking in there really quick and all of a sudden the wall behind the chair lights up. So we talked outside the door for a while trying to get this guy to say, okay, I, I screwed up and he didn't. We didn't, and when we do this, we don't point the gun at anybody or say bang, bang, you're dead. So we finished the drill, I went, find a guy, went to find a guy later and I, I asked somebody who was in that room and he said it was Bob. So I phoned Bob and I said, you know, you're dead, Bob. And he goes, what do you mean? You, didn't, you guys, you, you opened the door, you didn't see me. I said, your phone lit up the back of the wall. Said, yeah. He never thought about that. So we always tell staff, okay, even if you got it silenced, put it down. Put it on the carpet so that if it goes off, it's not lighting up the room behind you. But if it's on a hard surface, it might vibrate. It might vibrate. Then hold it up against you like this. But do something. Just be aware that that's going to happen. That's going to happen. I, I have not found a phone yet that doesn't do that. So again, all kinds of things to think about. Don't advertise a rally point. This is not one of those situations where you want a rally point. Why don't you want a rally point? <coughs> Pardon? Exactly. You know Columbine failed? The whole idea with Columbine is they were they had bombs planted in the building. The bad, the good thing was that they were, they were bad bomb makers. They also had one in a trunkable car where they knew that law enforcement and EMS were going to rally because when they had done drills, that's where they always rallied. That one didn't go off either. So when the bombs didn't go off, they decided to go in. But what they wanted to do was force everybody out through the door because they knew where they were going to rally because that was their rally point for fire drills. And they were going to shoot them as they came out the door. If that had happened, it would have been more than 20-some people killed. So I had one, one hospital and I said, you guys have a rally point? And they said, yep, yeah, it's the community center. And everybody was proud. And I said, cool. <clears throat> you fired me yesterday and I am mad as hell. And my buddy Toywo over there, his mom died on your operating room table and there's nine people telling him that your doctors were incompetent and he's mad at you too. So we got a plan. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start shooting and Toywo is waiting for you down at the community center. Everybody goes, whoa, probably not a good idea. 
just tell people to get out and go someplace. But think about, again, when you're going out that door, where do you go? And when you get someplace, then notify somebody. Even if it's just 911 that I'm here, let everybody know I'm here, they'll figure it out later. But don't have a rally point. Because if the shooter's a disgruntled person, they know your plan. One of the things that we have found, again, because of all those uh, psychological things that are going on, is if we have multiple four buildings and this happens on the third floor, guess what? The people running down from the third floor don't bother to stop on the first and second floor and let them know why they're running. Conversely, the first floor people don't get in the stairwell and decide to go up and let the second and third floors know what's going on. It's happened. It's happened. I'm not making this stuff up. That's why we're finding that it's important to have that one tone in larger buildings like this. this. Or if there's a tone that goes off that says clearly this tone is here because somebody in this building is armed. And again, you can get it so it enunciate at least the point of, of where that push button was pushed. First floor, second floor, at least that helps. And that's, that's crucial for that question about what do I do with my patients. I was out at the uh, National Fire Protection Association conference last week and I actually had a chance to sit down with some folks from across the country and talk about active shooters. One gentleman had a murder-suicide in his hospital and they, this was before the training, before they did training. There were eight people on that unit when the sh two, two shots were fired. Three ran, two froze, and three jumped on patients. So what really is your responsibility to the patients? And I can't, you don't, don't go back and, and say, Mike said this. Mike is telling you there are options. But if you think that, that I'm going to shield my patients with my body, you're crazy. Because all that does is give that shooter two people with one shot, unless it's a 22. Remember, actively engaged in killing. This is not a tornado coming where you can get them to a safe room or get them inside the building and those kinds of things, where your life clearly is as much in danger as everybody else's, but you're still functioning. This is somebody's running around with some kind of a weapon trying to inflict harm and kill people. He said after they did after they did the debrief, he asked those three people, what were they attempting to do by jumping on patients? And after they thought about it, they're going, hmm, probably not a good idea. There are some videos out there right now that will tell you that if you can't move the patient, you shut the lights off, tell them to be quiet. You can pull the, pull the sheet up on them so they look like they're deceased. You can look at them and say, help me or follow me. If you're in a clinic and you're in an exam room and you know you can't go and this lady is my patient, I'm going to say, help me barricade the door. If she decides to fall in a corner and cry, what do you do? Yeah. Let her cry. And that's why we tell the staff, try and move the exam table during a drill so you know that you can do it. If you can't, then what are your other options to barricade that door? If I tell her to follow me and she falls in a corner and cries, what do I do? I leave her. It's critical that people page if it's on the first floor so that the fourth floor has time to prepare. So I'm not saying that you abandon your patients. Everybody in the hospital just bails and leave the patients there. If you have time to do something, that's different if you're ground, than if you're ground zero. If you're ground zero, it's everybody for themselves. And I have not found a police department that has told me otherwise. Now, the gentleman from this, from this hospital said, there's one thing that, 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 is, that is constant, is lawsuits. You didn't do enough, you didn't do training, you didn't do this. He said, that's, that's inevitable. No matter what you do, you're going to get sued because you didn't do the opposite. But if you can let the staff on the fourth floor, third floor, second floor know that there's a shooting in the lobby, that gives them a chance to do some things. And we're going to talk about some of those things here in a minute. That's why it's crucial that you have something to alert the building so that when people are running out on the first floor, the second, third, and fourth, and whatever floor know what's going on. So it's critical that you come up with some kind of a plan. But shielding patients with your body is not good because we need you later to save whoever was shot. We have a finite amount of healthcare workers. If we have eight healthcare workers on a unit, because think of this, I know for a fact I've got a ward with, with a, a floor with 35 patients on it, and those of you in a hospital, how many, how many staff do you usually have on that floor? Do you have one-to-one? -one? Probably got eight staff. So who do they decide which bodies they're going to shield? Clearly there's 20-some there's people there that they can't do much with. 
So you need to think about what are my options. It's not really good in this case unless that floor knows ahead of time that there's something going on below them so they can do some things. And we're going to talk about that in a second. That's when we get into hide. Hide and barricade. If you can't run, this is your next option. What's the difference between cover and concealment? Anybody? What's cover? Cover you get behind something and hide to, to provide cover between you and... Okay, anybody else? Gives you protection. Cover stops bullets. Cover stops bullets. Concealment is standing behind your shower curtain going, I hope they don't see me, because it's not going to stop anything. Unfortunately, in most facilities, in this room, you can think about what do we have in here for cover? Not much. You know, the, the days, the days the, in, the, in the movies, and forget what you see in TV, folks. Just flat out forget it. it doesn't, it's, there's nothing in there that's realistic or other than maybe the police coming in screaming at the cop that wants to put the effing gun down. That's probably about as close as it comes into where they come in and pull the trigger and shoot you. But flipping a table over and using a table for cover. Maybe if it's a 22, it might not go through this, but even a 22 will go through six one inch pine boards and still have enough power to blow a pop can up. And I know that because we show that to our students when we're doing gun safety. I do DNR gun safety classes. So think about it. File cabinets, if you get to the point where not like you're at the spot where you're pulling the door open. So you got all that paper in front of you. If your file cabinets are like mine, you need a bob cap to move them. Or a book shelf where the books are going away from you this way, not where you can read the title of the books. Remind staff in your facilities when they're walking around, if they're going to hide in a room, does it lock? And if it does, how does that lock work? I had one lady tell me in the hospital that she came from, they have actually put a silver or blue or white dot on the door that says this door locks. Because that, that particular lock, you have to push in and turn. If you sit there and push it, it's just going to keep popping out. Try that when somebody's running down the hall, screaming guy with a gun, or somebody's popping off rounds and they're coming in your direction. Have them figure out how it locks. And I'll, I'll give you a story about that in a minute. If you think you're going to get your key in that, and lock it, you're crazy. The other thing is, this is a deadbolt. So there's a there's a, a, a latch that pops out of that. We have some facilities, or some rooms, that that's on the back side. There clearly is no way to lock that door. Because even if you open a door and lock it, can you shut it? No, the bolt's sticking out. So what we're doing is having facilities go back and taking that off and putting the flipper on. Interesting story about that. Again, have people try it. It's muscle memory. You need to get that muscle memory in there. I'm going to show you a video here in a minute. And it was in that same room that the nurses went into the room and had a deadbolt on. It was in a surgery center. And they flipped the lock. And then they just sat in a corner. So Sheen's out in the hall shooting. And he hits the door once. And it doesn't open. He backs up and he hits it again. And he walks right in. And these three ladies were sitting down there, and their eyes were the size of three-pound coffee can bottoms. And they went, oh, and he just went, boom, boom. Sorry, ladies, <clears throat> you got to try something better next time. So they came out doing a debrief, and this nurse, oh, but I, I uh, oh, yeah, but what I did is I didn't physically, I just kind of gave it a flip. And so what happened was it went partway in, so when he hit it the first time, it was still kind of hung up on the door frame. And then when his weight came off of it, it relaxed and it, it just kind of popped back in that quarter inch or less it was sticking out and then he walked right in. So you see the next time in the video she looks at it and she goes, mm -hmm. she physically makes sure she locks it. She told me afterwards, she said, I'll never forget that as long as I live. So make sure that they understand that. Will you be able to push the keypad? If that is your plan, are you going to do this? No, probably not. If you do, it's going to be more luck than anything. One of our nurses in our clinics, this was her, this, this was the med room. She's, after the first drill, we said, Any, anybody got anything else they want to talk about? And this hand meekly comes up from the back of the group. And she said, I just want you to know, my plan was the med room. She sits three in front of that. She said, I have punched that keypad every day for three and a half years, a couple dozen times a day going in that med room. That was my plan. She said, after the third time, and it didn't open, because what happens in these situations is when you're not thinking clearly is you tend to get into a loop, and if you did it wrong the first time, you're going to do it wrong the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time. And whether she was not hitting the numbers right or she was hitting them too fast, 
How many of you have a garage door opener for you and you know the code you go bing, 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 bing and it goes blink, 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 blink and the door doesn't do anything. All right, I gotta slow down. She said, my plan was then, I'm thinking, I gotta run. Now, she said, I came in that same back door every day for the same three and a half years that I've been punching this keypad. She says, I know when I'm facing that, that door, the med room, that the door that I came in is on the right. She said, I ran to the left. I have no clue why I ran to the left. She said, now I had to go all the way around and the hallway takes her behind that med room and then it bisects with an intersection that if she would have ran in the first place, she would have been like from here to the cameraman and then out the door. She goes, I'm running down that hall and she said, I am just in my pants thinking that if I get to that intersection, you guys are coming down that hall, I'm dead at that intersection. And she said, fortunately, you guys had moved down to the next hall, which is kind of like where I had just run by, and, and she said, I got out the door. So, we did the drill again. We started in an exam room this time. We debriefed the second time, and I said, what was your plan this time? She said, I went back to my desk, and I sat down, and I thought, and I visualized left, 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 left. And she said, I heard the screaming in the exam room. My ears perked up as soon as I heard the shots. She said, my feet never touched the carpet. I got up, went to the left. I was out the door into the woods in about three seconds because I had thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. She said, that's my plan. I know I can get out that door in about three seconds now. So watch out for those things. Door wedges and kick downs. Why don't the fire marshals like these things? If you're in a hospital, you can't have them, right? If you're in a business occupancy, which is doctor's offices, or a bank, or a store, you can have these things. Technically, if you're in your office, you can wedge it open. If you're not, you need to shut the door. Why do fire marshals hate these things? What are we telling you to do? Close the door. Close the door. Your brain's not thinking, push it open a little bit to relieve the pressure on the... And so what's happened, you know, fire codes are a reaction. Something bad happens, so they make a code that says, don't do that because something bad's going to happen. It's happened. I've seen it. I've seen it in drills. People will, will try to shut that door. They don't need to shut the door, and they're trying to pull the door wedge out at the same time, but they're pulling harder than they... And the door wedge binds, and they get it to the point where they can't even open the door now. We did a drill up in two harbors in a clinic. It was a kick down on a door. Police officer started shooting. A couple of my guys jumped the front desk, went in the back. They came out, and, and my, my security manager and one of the deputy sheriffs, who was up there, both like about 6'2 and about 240, they're laughing. <clears throat> one and the lady in front of them going, Bob, Bob, where's Bob? Maintenance guy, that, that kick down's off that door now. And he goes, What? She goes, I was trying to shut the door and pull that thing at the same time. She said, I pulled the door so hard, she bent it <laughs> back under the door. It took two 240-pound guys to lift it up and push the door back against the wall far enough to be able to relieve the pressure on that so that they could, open, they could pop that thing out. That's what happens. That's why they don't like door wedges. So pre-lock your doors, but don't put door wedges in them. If you come into your office in the morning and you need to lock your door, with a key and there's nothing unlock it and there's nothing on the back of it to lock it with then pre-lock it so that if you hear shooting you kick the rock out I know everybody goes up to Duluth and you go to Lake Superior steal a rock from Lake Superior put, it, put your door put your door open with the, with the lock lock put your rock down there so when something happens all you do is kick the rock out of the way slam the door shut and now you got a rock hit somebody over the head with when they walk in the door but you need to have staff think about this because if they have a door wedge in there and they're trying to get that door wedge out, they know they got to get it out. Nine out of ten times they are not going to, or they're not going to be able to get this thing up either. All right. So when you're in an exam room, what do you have the barricade with? You have exam tables. They're pretty heavy. One of the things we do is we tell staff, please try this ahead of time or during the drill. Can you get that exam table to move? Sometimes they're on carpet. That's tough. That's even tougher than the linoleum, even with the rubber bumpers on it. So we have them try this to see if they can do it ahead of time or during the drill. We had one clinic where nobody had tried it. Did anybody try and barricade? They said no. I said, this time somebody tried, just so you know you can do it. So two of the tiniest young ladies in this clinic went into that exam room. They moved the table. I couldn't get in. 
and the police, the, the sheriff's lieutenant tried for the whole duration of the drill, which was about 10 minutes, and he couldn't get in either. They came home, hey, we made it. We tell people, you know, be aware of what you can fight with. A funny story about that one. I spoke at the engineer, Minnesota Engineers Conference up in Hinckley. The gentleman that was in that video came up. I didn't know he was there that day. He shook my hand. He said, hey, and we that's it. Good to see you. He said, I'm looking forward to the training coming up. I said, by the way, you're a movie star. You're in my presentation. He goes, really? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, okay. So I showed that video. He came up when I was all done. He said, you know, I want, he said, I wanted to raise my hand. He said, but you were on a roll. I didn't want to screw your energy level up. He said, I didn't know you were, there was anybody in that room taking that video. He said, it was a drill. I didn't know that he was in there taking that video. Yeah, we don't, we don't sugarcoat them. They learned that in that particular case, that stacking other things up next to that chair all the way to the wall would have stopped him from opening the door. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. They did, we didn't get in that time. But one of the other things that we do is we try and grab a hostage and stick them outside the door and say, please, please let us in and let us in. We've actually had one person let us in. And she opened the door and said, are you the shooter? And Sergeant goes, no, but I am. Why didn't you open a door? Well, there was this sweet young lady out there that needed help. We have actually had, and we've had more people not open the door, which is the best thing to do. And they said it's tough, but they realize if they open the door, they're going to be shot as well. Again, I don't have I don't have hard and fast. I've got some options, but in that case, remember, actively engaged in killing. So what we what we try and show people is is oops, is set yourself up so that uh, in in this particular case, you've got something up against the, the door, and your wedge all the way up against the the side of the uh, cabinet. I don't like the table that way because I've actually almost dumped a couple opening the door because of the center of gravity on those things. But if that's the only way you can get it there and you can barricade in there, that's 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 then do it. This is another option. So that, that table is not going anywhere. Now, nobody's asked this yet. What about shooting through the door? When I've done some checking and investigating and asking police officers, how often does this happen? They say it's, they know two instances where somebody was shot firing because somebody fired through the door. Remember, they want a body count. They don't want to shoot the door. There's another way to do that. If you, if, yes, sir. And that the doors you're talking about is specific, specific to healthcare facilities, correct? In some cases, but I mean, a door is a door. Well, not really. Well, I, mean, I would think most of the doors, the commercial doors, they've got solid core. You may get in an office setting, and then you got hollow cores. Yeah, and again, you know, I mean, again, what if in healthcare? Yeah, you've got you've got solid doors. This is a 20-minute door, but a 22 is going to go through that thing. It's going to go through any door. The only good thing about this is the frames are metal because of the fire codes. In 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 uh, business occupancies, they may not be, and so if somebody hits that door hard, but again, the door has to be able to flex in order to break. If you've got something up against it like this, it can't flex. Now, would what I'm doing there work in a commercial situation? It wouldn't work in my house. But if I've got a solid door and I get my foot wedged up against her like that, we've had we've had women that are smaller than some of the women in here try this, and they, we could not get the door open. And we had a police officer that's uh, four inches taller than I am, and we all weighed me by 40 pounds. He couldn't budge that door. So it's not going to work in heels, ladies, but it will work. It will work in this circumstance with those kinds of shoes on. This is something else, so here we go. If you were on a nursing unit and you knew that something was happening several floors below you, and you can get your patients behind a set of double doors like this, in healthcare we know we can't lock these doors. Yes, you can, there's one way you can do it. You can put magnetic locks on them with a push button, but you're talking about three grand or better a door. Now, the new 2012 Life Safety Code is out. CMS just adopted it. They are allowing us some different ways to be able to lock these doors. I haven't had a chance to sit down and really uh, get into it right now, but according to the folks at the NMPA conference, yes, we are now able to lock some doors because of the circumstances. So that's one way. If you can get the if you can get the bed so that it goes this way, you're you know you're better off. But at least lock the wheels, get it up there. What else can you do? Well, if you are in a business occupancy, you can do this. You can just wedge that up in there, and now that door is not going to go. Put a deadbolt on the other one. If you're in a healthcare organization, if you have those things available, and in this circumstance you probably can, just take a piece of conduit, bend it, drop it through, and the other side of that door is not going to go anywhere. They can pull on it all they want. Here's another one. 
tie wraps. You got to be fairly strong to work that tie wrap, but you don't have to be strong to work the conduit. And again, gross motor skills, drop it through. My goal eventually is to have a box by all my doors where some of these pieces of hardware are in there and all my staff has to do is grab the right one for that door and they're good to go. <clears throat> What's this all about? What we, what we always tell staff too, if you've got an office, if you're, in a, if you're a director and you're not in a nursing unit, rearrange your desks and stuff so your file cabinets are by the door and then have your door wedge on top of your file cabinets. And if somebody is trying to get in, you can't get out, you wedge the door with the door wedge and get on the other side of your file cabinet and tip it up against the wall or up against the door so that they can't get in. Try and move your desk up against there. So if you're in a non-patient care area, what do you have in your room that you can use pre-arrange ahead of time? Like lock, pre-lock your door, put the rock there, can I move my desk, can I move my file cabinet? The reason we have this here is law enforcement will tell you just don't start coming out of your rooms when this is all over. Law enforcement will clear the building. They will knock on your door and say, this is the whoever police department or the sheriff's department. Is there anybody in there? They will clear the building. And it work. Those people are going to be in their rooms for 45 minutes before the PD gets there or the sheriff's department and then for some time afterwards. That three-story building I showed you before, the PD said it would probably take them three hours to clear that. So they're telling us to make have the staff, if you've got a safe room or just in your office, is to get a bucket. Put some things in it that you may need to stay in there with for several hours. You may need to pee and poop in this bucket. That's why there's toilet paper. You may want a tourniquet and a first aid kit. Why? Well, if you and your coworker get into that room and that's your only choice, but your coworker is shot in the leg on the way in, you need to stop the bleeding. And so that's where the tourniquets come in. Water, food, flashlight, hammer. Somebody said, well, you know, we, we wanted to put a hammer in ours because it's a good weapon, but, but we were told we can't, we, can't, we can't put it in there because it's a weapon. I said, well, tell them you're putting it in there to break the window out, and you're going to use it as a weapon if you have to, but don't tell them the weapon part. So you can even probably get a... <clears throat> Get yourself a dog. My dog wanted to come in and be in it. You can get a blow-up dog and put it there. Yes? So if I'm not going to open it, the door for my friend Sally May, why am I going to open it for you, detective? Good question. That happened in Sandy Hook. Teacher would not open the door. She's in a closet with five kids. If you have your cell phone or you have a landline, most rooms have a cell phone or have a landline in them, unless you're in a bathroom or something, you call 911. Say, there's a guy outside my door, he says he's Sergeant Sheen. I don't believe him. 911 and you will work this out. And that's what happened out in Sandy Hook. And there was enough of a gap under the door where the, where the, the police officer was finally able to slide his badge underneath there. And they worked it out and she opened the door and she was in there with five kids. This is a hard one, folks. This is a tough one. If you've been in the military or you're ex-law enforcement or whatever, you've been trained to do this. Most of us have not. It is not normal for us to want to kill or to fight, even to fight. We don't want to harm people. Folks, if this is your last resort, you need to do this like there's nothing else to live for. Because there isn't. This is the fight of your life for your life. Remember, actively engaged in killing. You know what your attacker is trying to do. There's somebody at home that wants you there, folks. My wife wants me to come home on payday Fridays because she knows we're going out to dinner. <laughs> the other 13 days, unless something's broke, I'm not sure, but my dog does because he wants to go hunting and my wife won't take him hunting. You've got somebody that wants you to come home. Wife, husband, significant other, grandkid. But you, you've got somebody that wants you to come home. You might get shot, but it doesn't mean you're gonna get you're gonna die. A lot of people get shot and they don't die. The last movie theater shooting out in Colorado, the lady that stopped it was a teacher. <coughs> she actually got in the way and decided to fight and she got shot in the leg and she's alive. You know, discount what you see on TV. When you see on TV somebody gets shot, they go flying back against the wall or they go, you know, Dirty Harry, well, do you feel lucky? He pulls the trigger on the 44 and a guy goes, how many feet off the dock? It doesn't work that way. When I've talked to people that have been in combat and been shot, they go, I didn't even know I was shot until this thing was over, unless they got shot to the point where they couldn't move their arm or whatever. It doesn't work that way. 
If one person fights, you all do. If somebody comes in this room and I jump on them, everybody on this front row jumps on them. That's what it's going to take. If that's what it takes, that's what you need to do. So fight of your life for your life. In Virginia Tech, I'm not a statistics person, but this is the only one I've got in here. There was five rooms involved in that shooting. Two rooms fought back, there was two people killed. One student, one teacher. The other three rooms didn't, there was 27 people killed. What room do you want to be in? I know the one I want to be in. Again, think about it. What can I fight with? If somebody comes down that corridor and they're pulling something out, what can I fight with? This is where we tell our staff it's okay to throw your computer. I had somebody ask me, can I throw my computer? Absolutely. You probably all want to throw your computer a couple times a day. I do. I don't want to throw it. I want to take it up to the ninth floor and watch it hit underneath the bus on the, on the first floor. Anything that you can fight with, folks. Think about it. Some of you have name badges on. Teresa, you've got your name badge on there. If you rub that on your face, does it hurt? All right, and, and not even any force. Think about just bearing down with all the strength you have on somebody's face. Is it going to hurt? It's going to hurt. You look at that desk, what can you fight with? Pencils, scissors, there's all kinds of stuff there. So we talk about that with the staff. We'll see some more here in a minute. The other thing I always hear from people is, well, how do I know when the gun is armed, disarmed, whatever? And, and I have not brought a gun into training. I'm thinking of trying to find a toy gun that's as real as I possibly can. But in this particular case, those of you that are familiar with an AR, I'm either I'm jammed or I'm having some problems with that gun because I'm pulling back on a charging handle. I can't use that gun at that point. Same thing there, I'm reloading. We had a situation up in Two Harbors where the, the uh, police officer is doing this because his gun was jammed. He fired one blank and it jammed. There was five people who ran by him. So when we did the debrief, he said, you five people that ran by me, why didn't you say we're going to jump on you? Because we tell people, don't, you know, don't physically do anything to us, but if we break in or whatever, we want you to tell us what you would do. We weren't even thinking, they just wanted to get the hell out of there. But he had to actually go back and get another gun because it was not usable. So there I'm reloading. Somebody comes in the room. Grab it, slam the door against their arms. You got a scalpel in there, this is a good time to use it. Same thing in this scenario, handgun, up against the wall, slam the door into their arms. You also have alcohol hand sanitizer there. In some of the rooms, you've got some things that spray. She's got her peri knife that she was gonna use to cut her apple up for lunch today. She grabbed that with a can of spray. How many of you have mace? Ladies, any of you have mace with you today? Guys? That works. I mean, in our facility, that's not considered a weapon. It's personal protective equipment. Ladies, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. <clears throat> How many of you have mace? Not with you, but do you have mace? Anybody have it? Where is it? One of her bags. I like that answer. I, get, I hear that all the time. I've had actually two people in the three or four thousand I've trained, two young ladies that have it on my keychain and it's in my hand because that's what's going to do you some good. If you bought something to protect yourself with, it's got to be in your hand. Clip to your purse in your hand. It's the same thing in now. If it's in your room and you want to fight with it, it's got to be where you can get at it, not having to dig for it. Things that spray. What is What has a long distance that sprays and if you get it in your eyes, you know it burns. Wasp killer, hornet killer. I could probably hit the coffee pot from here with that stuff. All right, nothing says you can't have it in your office. So this lady's got her can of Lysol. It works. If you were in a patient's room, you've got all kinds of stuff in there. If you take this lamp and use it as a club, when I'm coming through the door, it's going to hurt, right? Think about it. What do you have? Right now, if somebody came in here, what do we have to fight with? There's flags back there with some real sharp things on the end of it. Guys, we have belts with buckles that really hurt. I know I've been hit by the leather part of it when I was a kid. I've never been hit by the metal part, but that's got to hurt. We got trash cans. We got the legs on that on that camera. We got everything. I, I, like I said, I teach up at the university, and in one of my classes, we were doing this presentation, and I had a former Marine young man, 26 years old. I said, if somebody broke in here, what would you fight with? He goes, sir, everything in this room is a weapon, sir. 26-year-old, <laughs> 55-gallon testosterone. But he's right, everything. 
everything in here, the chairs, the tables, your shoelaces, get them around the neck. In an exam room, you've got hydrogen peroxide, you've got all kinds of stuff. You get hydrogen peroxide in somebody's face, you fill a cup with it, there's a cup up there. You fill a cup with the hydrogen peroxide, and you go back to the scene where I've got the gun up against the wall, somebody throws the hydrogen peroxide or the rubbing alcohol in their face, are they going to be able to see? No. And that's the point when you've got the advantage. Because they are not expecting you to do anything. When I do this for, for when I'm doing the training, I have a cup here that has my day-old coffee in it. It really doesn't. But I throw it at people, you'd be surprised at the reaction you get. It's, got, it's full of bags of M&Ms. But they don't know that. They think it's my coffee. But do something, even if you just yell, hey! <laughs> that might be what you need to get them to freeze for the second for you to get off your chair and out the door. If you throw your coffee at them, if you throw the alcohol at them, if you do something, you have gained yourself that second or two that you need to fight with. So think about it. What do you have? Pens, pencils, computer. Something else that works is that tubing around the neck. Somebody tackle them low, somebody get that around their neck. Now, something else, spray. This works great. This is, this is something that somebody came up with so they wouldn't lose their keys. And that's the wrench for a, a oxygen tank to open up the, uh, the tank. This little thing is those rollers that you use for fuzz, the sticky things that you peel them off. That's what that is. That hurts. Get somebody with that, that hurts. They improvise. Hey, I got this, I can fight with that. Sure they do. Fire extinguishers. If you're going to go in one of those bathrooms and you know that's where you have to go, take the fire extinguisher with you. Spray them in the face if they come in. And then smash their skull in with it. I had one nurse tell me there is no way that I could, I could hit them with that. And I said, why? They said, I'm afraid I would hurt them. They have just declared what they would do by shooting people, and you're going to tell me you can't hit them? Well, I just tell them I have three kids at home under the age of five. And how did that work for the rest of the folks? If somebody's coming in, any shootings that you know of, that they say, excuse me, do you have any grandkids at home you want to see? I won't shoot you. you got three kids at home? Okay, I'm going to let you go. doesn't happen. The closest I've heard is, are you Muslim or are you Christian? And that was in the United States. That was somewhere else. So, in the words of Sergeant Paul Wintershide from the, from the Superior Police Department, he said, you hit them with that. To the point where when we tell you to take them out, we mean you kill them, if that's what happens. You don't hold back, you hit them with that as hard as you can. He said, this isn't where you hit them over the head and then you break to a television commercial and when the commercial comes back, I'm walking out the door with them in handcuffs. He said, you hit them so they don't get off the floor. And then, and this is the hardest part, if you get the gun and you're in a tussle with them and you know how to use it, use it. You are perfectly within your right to shoot them. You have no idea whether they have another gun or not. The folks in San Bernardino had long guns and handguns. Just don't be hanging on to that gun when the police come in the door. You are within your right. If that's your last option, and there's not nine people sitting on them, and it's, some, on, it's you or them, or them, and you got the gun, use it. Somebody said, well, maybe it's unsafe. Well, for crying out loud, they've been shooting people with it. Do you think they put it on safe after they, they shoot one person, they put it back on safe? Okay, pull the trigger. If it doesn't work, hit them with it and throw it away. You've got to get your mind wrapped around it. Also beware of doors that have those little locks in them where you can stuff something like this in there and pop them. I literally scared a couple of ladies like this. I said, be careful, though, because I can get in there with that, with that knife. And so I had some ladies... <laughs> do that and I open the door and they're just sitting there like, oh boy. One lady I actually scared, literally. <clears throat> She's in the bathroom, I popped the door open, I immediately got hit in the head with a can of Lysol. She says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, no, no, that's fine. You, but you did, the only thing you did wrong is you should have sprayed me with it. And I've had that happen before too. And she said, I meant to, but it slipped out of my hand. She said, I really was in here going to the bathroom when this started. I didn't think you were going to start so soon. So it happens. <laughs> So again, we, we, we try and force entry as much as we can. We want people to go home realizing and knowing that what they did that day will work. So some other things. Don't come out until the law enforcement tells you to. Don't open doors to coworkers. Take your names off your doors. If somebody coming back looking for you, everybody knows where your office is. You know where your office is, especially in mental health units. Get your names off the doors. Try not to lock the police out. One of the clinics or hospitals we did this at, 
their plan was in the middle of this, the maintenance guy was going to go around and lock all the doors. Why are you locking the guy in? You just locked the police out. They decided after the first drill that wasn't a good thing. Listen to responding law enforcement agency, follow their instructions. Three echo. Three echo is a scenario where the police will go in, after, usually when they get there, several police will go in immediately, try and stop the shooter, either take them out, barricade them, get them blocked in or whatever. The next law enforcement agents will go in with paramedics. And three echo is you've got three law enforcement agents and a V in front, two paramedics in the middle, and another law enforcement agent walking behind. And the, the second paramedic's got his hand on his or her belt leading them. Their body armor is the paramedic's body armor. They will go in with a tourniquet and a sheet. If you're bleeding, they'll put the tourniquet on you and stop the bleeding. If you're able to walk, they'll walk you out. If you can't, they'll roll you over on the sheet and they will reverse direction. They will drag you out. That is all you can expect. The initial responding law enforcement agents will step over you if you are wounded on the floor. They know that they need to stop this thing and by helping you, there's, it's giving the shooter more time. So that's what 3 Echo is all about. There are some law enforcement jurisdictions that call it something different and there are some that have no clue what this even is. So I can't tell you how they're going to respond. That's why when we do these drills and this training, I like to bring in the local law enforcement agency to tell the staff what their response is going to be. And again, if you're not sure it's law enforcement, call law enforcement. When it's over, you've got a crime scene. You may not get your building back really quick. The way it was explained to us when we did this two years ago or a year ago, we let the police department and the sheriff's rescue squad practice for six hours in one of our clinic buildings. In fact, the building I showed you in the picture. They did six or four entry scenarios for six hours. They, they had a chance to practice four, four scenarios. We had in our we, we did an MCI off the first scenario. We had uh, two lieutenants, a police and a sheriff's lieutenant. They told us that it works like this: if the, if the shooter gets killed, you'll get your building back a lot quicker because there's nothing to charge the person with their dead. We'll come in, they'll take the bodies out, we clean everything up, and we're back in business. If the shooter is not killed, and that's something to think about because you might be the one that's also treating both the people that were shot and the shooter if they're shot. It may take a while because they need to get this guy in front of a judge to find out exactly what they're charging him for, and before they before they can clean up, they need to know that. So it could be two weeks before you get your building back, or longer. So that's why that's up there. <clears throat> the recovery phase phase will take much longer. If you don't have a business continuity plan, you better come up with one, because you may not get your clinic back fast enough to do anything with it. If it's in your emergency room, you may be without part of your emergency room. If it happens in your lab, you may be without your lab. If it's in a bank and it happens in the front lobby, you're probably going to be out of business for a while. So you need to think about your contingency plan. That will take a lot longer than the initial 9 to 10 minutes that a normal active shooting situation takes place. <clears throat> your brand will suffer, media will arrive, and no matter what happens, be prepared for lawsuits. You guys are probably tired right now like those dogs are. <clears throat> so hopefully you got the point. Now, to answer her question about why don't you want to have the gun in your hand, I don't need to know this, but I'm sure in here, besides me, there's somebody who's got a permit to carry. One of the things I hear, and it's very noble, is I'm going to go out and get my gun out of my car, because most of us are not allowed to have them in the work, <coughs> come back in and I'm going to save my buddies. I'm telling you right now, stay out, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the police are coming, they know somebody in there with a gun is killing people. You have a gun in your hand. You may not even hear, take, put the gun down. You, the next thing you hear is a shot, you're down. When we did this on our clinic, <clears throat> the sergeant and the nurse, he said, well, I'm going to go out and get my gun and come back in. And Paul said, don't do that. I said, you know, the next thing you might hear is put the and gun down. And so I said, I may not even do that. He said, I'm probably just going to shoot you. I looked at him and said, you know me. He goes, today you're the shooter. He said, I know you. He said, but I don't know for the last year, maybe you've had a domestic with your wife, and it's kind of come to a head and your work's been suffering, and you've got the feeling that your performance appraisal is next week and they're going to let you go. And you just said, i got nothing to live for. My wife's taking the kids and I can't see them anymore. I'm going to lose my job. And he said, today you're the shooter. And I'm not going to stop and ask you because the time it takes me to ask you is going to be the time you shoot me. And I want to go home tonight too. The other thing is, I, like I said, I teach these classes. I don't train people to clear buildings. Unless you were in the military and you were over in Afghanistan and Iraq and you were trained with a short barrel M16 to clear a building and you're not coming in with one of those, you have no idea what you're getting into. Go back in the building. Now if you're in a building and you got it, 
like the uh, psychologist down in uh, South Carolina, I think it was, where the, where the patient came in with another staff member and the, the patient pulled out a gun and shot the staff member and then the psychologist pulled his gun out and shot. That's a different story. What I'm telling you is don't go back in and clear the building because when PD gets there, they don't know that. 